Hi everyone, uh, welcome to the ICT String Seminar. So today we have Sean Hartnell from Cambridge. So who will be talking to us about VLD with states of black holes and cosmological interiors. So over to you, Sean. Great, thank many thanks uh, for the organizers uh, for inviting me. Thanks for coming. Uh, please feel very free to ask questions as I go along. It'll make me feel like I'm talking to some real people. Um, excellent, good. So I'm going to follow a slightly historical path and slide to explain why um, I ended up doing what, 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 what I did. And so a few years ago, I was thinking about uh, black hole interiors. Uh, obviously, there's been a lot of discussion about black hole interiors in the last 10 years or so. And something that was on my mind is that classically, so certainly before anything uh, quantum happens, uh, black hole interiors are typically un unstable. So let me write that down. So black hole interiors are typically unstable. And that's very different from black hole exteriors, right? The black holes that we like to work with uh, to describe thermal states of quantum field theories uh, are normally stable. If you sneeze outside a black hole, your sneeze falls into the horizon. It gets a little bit bigger, uh, but the space time basically stays the same. If you sneeze inside a black hole, the space-time at the singularity will completely, completely change. Uh, and so the perhaps the most well-known version of that uh, are, are Cauchy horizons, right? So if you have a, a charged black hole, let's say, let me draw something like this, and that's the singularity. This is like the ADS boundary. And so it's it's very well known that if you if you sneeze in here. Uh, you'll destroy the, uh, this is the Cauchy horizon, right? There's an outer horizon, but there's also an inner horizon. And if you sneeze, uh, the inner horizon will go away. And it's not actually totally clear uh, what you end up with, uh, but perhaps you end up with something a bit more similar to a Schwarzschild black hole. But Schwarzschild black holes are also unstable, right? And so if you have your, um, your Schwarzschild ADS, for example, it doesn't have to be ADS though. If you're in the interior here and you sneeze, this future, this this approach, this the space time as you approach the singularity will be completely different. Okay, it'll be chaotic. Different points in space will decouple. At the very least, it'll be as bad as a BKL type type behavior. So, uh, towards the singularity, uh, there's generically going to be chaotic uh, behavior with uh, large spatial gradients, i.e., very inhomogeneous. So my concern or my, my, my thought in, in, in the face of these two things is that how much of this, all this discussion of the quantum gravity of black hole interiors, which mostly is built around the Schwarzschild ADS, uh, how much of it is actually true and how much depends on the classical background. Okay, that was, that was the starting point uh, a few years ago. Now, uh, the domain of black hole interiors in full generality is the you know, uh, the domain of mathematicians studying partial differential equations. Okay, so I'm not, I'm not that brave. Uh, okay, sorry. So, so the, the question is, what does all this mean in ADS-CFT? Right, and so just to repeat the message, just because the exterior of Schwarzschild ADS is a very robust space-time and very good thing to use, uh, the interior of ADS is not a robust space time, probably not a good thing to use. Uh, ADS watch out. Okay. Uh, so, uh, a simple as a simple step that I could imagine thinking about, we can ask a version of this question where we restrict to cohomogeneity one space times. So what, what that means in a more mundane sense of the word is that all the functions just depend on one variable. Okay, so, so if you have, you have scalar fields, they're a function of R, let's say, and the metric components are functions of R and, and so on. Okay, so we, we just consider what sort of a one-dimensional case, which is obviously a sort of spherically symmetric or planar symmetric. Obviously, that's a huge reduction, but even within uh, this reduced setting, uh, both of these two phenomena that I talked about here are, are visible. Um, so, right. So in this setting, where we where we think of all the bulk fields as just depending on one radial coordinate, 
in the in the exterior of a horizon <clears throat> this is very familiar and it and it is normally thought about in terms of holographic renormalization right so in in the exterior of a horizon these if you have your various feet right so here's the boundary <clears throat> there's some horizon and the fields evolve radially right so this phi of r is the radial evolution of the field as you go in and this is typically goes under the name of holographic renormalization And we can think of these functions as, descri as describing uh, the, the RG flow of some coupling constants in the dual field theory. And we know that in this language, the boundary is the UV and the horizon is the far infrared, right? The energy gets redshifted, infinitely redshifted at a horizon. So once you reach a horizon, that is the infinite IR of the, of the field theory RG flow. However, uh, if you've ever written down the Schwarzschild solution, you know that the gravity obviously doesn't stop at the horizon and the, the solution just goes just goes through. And so you might ask yourself, well, what what does the continued evolution of phi of r through the horizon mean um, holographically, right? And so we, it's not a very good name, but we, we call this, the continued evolution of this flow into this region, uh, we call it the trans IR. Okay, you flow through, keep going in the bulk. The bulk doesn't care about the horizon. The, the fields keep evolving. Uh, and so there's another reach, this holographic renormalization group flow uh, at finite temperature, which can just extend uh, through, through horizons. Okay. And so a couple of years ago now, we, we looked at what happens, right? So for example, in Schwarzschild, there's some G, the metric functions depend on R, okay? And, and you can you can just write down your Schwarzschild solution. Uh, and you could ask, well, what happens if you add a scalar field at the boundary, right? So you have a source, you, you turn on some source, some scalar field at the boundary, you deform Schwarzschild, it's a relevant deformation that grows as you go in. And so uh, what happens, right? And so the basic, the story, uh, what happens? Uh, so that was in this paper, so the basic story. It's not what I'm talking about today. This is all the historical motivation, but if you want to read about it, it's in this paper um, with uh, Alex Frankel, Yurt Krutov, and Darius Shi. What happens is that you find another solution, the flow continues through the horizon, there's a singularity, but the singularity is deformed. It's not Schwarzschild anymore. Uh, it's a more general Kasner solution. So near the singularity, you find a Kasner metric, which I remind you, looks like minus d tau squared. That's the proper distance to the singularity. And then there's some exponents, tau to the two pt dt squared plus tau two px dx squared plus dy squared. I'm always going to be in planar coordinates, okay? So the boundary directions are t, x, and y. And then this is the radial direction r. So near the singularity, you get some scaling behavior characterized by two exponents, pt and px. Okay, and the scalar field um, runs logarithmically uh, towards, towards the singularity. And so Schwarzschild EDS, Schwarz, the Schwarzschild singularity is a particular value for these, for these exponents, I think one third and two thirds. But when you deform the boundary by a scalar field, you get a different exponent in the exterior. And so that's a very simple sense in which Schwarzschild EDS the singularity is unstable. You deform, you put in a very small scalar field here, but the space time towards the towards the singularity has classically has a different a different uh, scaling exponent. Obviously, Sorry, um, yeah. Uh, does this uh, does this instability kick in a Planck scale away from the singularity or an ADS scale? No. Well, you can tune the Planck scale. That, right, so I was about to say that. Right. So obviously, the flow breaks down once you're once you. Are, are, are once coverage has become Planck scale, but you, you can make n as big as you like, right? So if uh, as big if n is big enough, you, you push the Planck scales as small as there's certainly no Planck scale in this solution, right? Uh, and so Planck scale is some ex other quantity that you can compare with. And so certainly this behavior can at large enough n, this will kick in well before the Planck scale. Yeah, it's not related to the Planck scale. That's right. Um, right. It, now, what it does do is kick in somewhat away from the horizon. Okay, so 
all this difference only happens when you're some distance in the interior, like several units of temperature away from the horizon. It doesn't kick in right away. I have a question. Yeah, please. So inside, once you enter the interior, I mean, once you enter the horizon, the role of the coordinates, space-time coordinates change. R becomes T, T becomes R. So oh yes, uh, of course. Sorry, I should have. Yes, that's also true. So this flow in the inside evolves in time. Yeah, it, it uh, develops in time. That's right. Yeah, that's, but that's in true. that case, it is no, no, no longer an RG flow, right? Well, okay, so this is what we're getting to. Okay, so so all, all I'm saying is that when you when you write down a solution. And of course, you should really go to cross score coordinates and 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 so on. Uh, but you can, like, when you write down Schwarzschild, you can write it down in Schwarzschild coordinates. And all that happens is that the T uh, becomes complex in in the interior. But you can write down all I'm saying. You write down a generalization of Schwarzschild where you have a non-zero scalar field phi of r. Do it numerically. That does, does doesn't matter. It's ODEs. It's it's, it's very simple, uh, and you'll get a a deformation of Schwarzschild, both inside and outside the horizon, that's characterized by one function of function of r. Okay, and r goes from uh, well infinity at the boundary to zero at the singularity, and it just goes through the horizon. Now, um, that's correct. So on the inside, r is time-like. On the outside, it's space-like. From the boundary, the RG flow clearly ends at the horizon, like I said. But there is this extra evolution in the inside, and you can ask, what does it mean for the boundary? It's certainly not a conventional RG flow in the boundary. Yes, that, that's correct. Okay. Yeah. Um, but again, this stopping things at the horizon is a bit less natural from a bulk point of view. Very good. Um, but indeed, that, that was exactly the question. So it's intriguing that there are these, there's this scaling behavior that emerges close to the singularity, it looks like some kind of fixed point. What, what is the field theory interpretation? Exactly. So I was exactly <laughs> in the spirit of this question. Uh, I was confused for a long time about the meaning of this interior RG, let's call it. Okay. So, and so where this talk really starts is then um, at some point uh, I realized, or I mean, it, it became clear that the way you should think about the, this evolution in the interior is in terms of a wheel of the width state. Okay, so, so let, let's think carefully a, a little for a moment about how I'm splitting up the space. So it's basically that one is thinking about slices that in the exterior are going like this. Right, but in the interior, they're going like this. Slices like this are naturally thought of as partition functions, but slices like this are more naturally thought of as wave functions. However, they obey, they obey the same equation. That, that's going to be one point I'm going to make. So uh, this, but one, this evolution in time in the interior, I'm now going to explain, uh, it is natural to think about it. So natural to think of the interior data on these slices in terms of Wheeler DeWitt states. Okay, and that was the point of this paper, 2208, 04348, uh, that I wrote last year. So let me explain that to you first. Okay, so first I want to explain this connection between partition functions in the exterior with these running couplings and wave functions in the interior. Okay, and to do that, we should start with Hamilton Jacobi theory. Okay, so we're going to do the classical version. And so I'm going to briefly run through how this works because I, I know from experience that Hamilton Jacobi theory is, while it is, is elementary in some way, it's not something that people necessarily have at the front of their heads. So, with a view to understanding this flow through the horizon, um, let me remind you. So, what we're going to do is I'm going to rederive classical Schwarzschild. shields. ADS solution from Hamilton Jacobi theory. Okay. So just bear with me. We're going to take a step back just to talk about Schwarzschild and just classical and 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 let me show you how it works. So this is going to, this is going to be a little bit technical, but I, I think it's sorry, not technical, explicit, uh, but I think it's fairly straightforward, hopefully. 
So the action, we're going to be in four dimensions because we live in four dimensions. We don't live in ADS, but okay, never mind. So we're going to do Einstein, Einstein gravity uh, plus the cosmological constant plus the Gibbons Hawking uh, boundary term. And we're going to look for metrics that depend on just one variable. Uh, but let's think about the interior. Okay, so imagine I'm going to start, we're going to get everywhere, but let, let's think about a sort of a cosmological situation. So we'll look for a metric of this form, minus n squared dr squared plus v to the two thirds. v is going to be a volume. And I'm about to run out of space here. So let me that over. All right. Um, e to the 4k over 3. I'll, I'll tell you what this is in a second. Plus e to the minus 2k over 3. Sorry. And again, my spacing is not good. Uh, dx squared plus dy squared. Okay, so what have we got here? We have a four dimensional space time. It's got three coordinates, a four, sorry, R, T, X, and Y. I'm looking at planar black holes because they're just a little bit easier. N, V, and K are functions of R. So N of R, V of R, um, K of R. And I'm really imagining I'm in the interior. And that's why I put a minus sign here. R is like is a time-like direction. And V is the overall volume of the spatial slices. That's why I factored it out. And K is sort of the shape of the spatial slices, right? It's 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 a, it doesn't know about the volume. So it's like the conformal, it tells us about the, conf the shape of, of the of the slices. Okay. It turns out that this parameterization is useful, right? So V is the volume, right, of the of the spatial three slice, right? This is the three slice, uh, and K is its shape. So you take this ansatz, you plug it into the action, you get a Lagrangian, which ends up being this one. So what the first thing you see is that N is a Lagrange multiplier as, as you might have expected, and the kinetic terms for k and v, right? So n imposes a constraint. This is the Hamiltonian constraint. You can write it in momenta, right? So you define the momentum from the Lagrangian uh, in, in the usual way. And the constraint is, so, for, so pi of k is dl dk dot. Uh, etc. Right, I define momenta, and then the constraint is minus i k squared plus v squared by v squared plus sixteen v squared is zero. I'm just trying to be very explicit so that it's really there's nothing mystical happening. Okay, you you write down Lagrangian. There's a constraint. You write down a constraint in the Hamiltonian language, which involves momenta. Okay, and this is the Hamiltonian constraint. Can I ask a question? Please go ahead. Yes. Yeah. The Gibbons Hawking boundary term was that yes. at the horizon? Is that where you put it? Uh, no, it was at the boundary. And what is the boundary? Uh, ADS. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Very good. No, actually, <laughs> good, good. Uh, it, it, it's uh, actually it's it's more like the future infinity in this case, actually. But to be <laughs> honest, it's it's actually not essential. You you will get this uh, without the Gibbons Hawking term. Um, Thanks. But, but 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 sorry, I can to be very precise about what was done. If you just write down this, uh, you'll find you'll get uh, second derivative terms in your Lagrangian, and the Gibbons Hawking term killed. You turn those into a total derivative, and then you ignore the total derivative. That 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 that's that's what's technically done. Um, so yeah, I understood your first answer, but I got confused by second one. Shouldn't you put it at the boundary of uh, ADS? Or well, it's just that this slicing is. I'm doing this slicing. This is sort of an interior kind of way of, but I could have done the exterior and you would have put it at the boundary of ADS. It, it's so basically you have to neglect any boundary terms that you get. So the 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 reason you impose any boundaries, any boundaries that there are, there needs to be this given Hawking term because when you write down this action, just the Einstein Hilbert action, there is a second derivative term of the metric functions. 
which you get our total derivative, you get rid of them, and then you get some boundary terms and you want to get rid of those boundary terms if you want to have a Dirichlet problem. Um, oh, it, it's really not, it turns out, it, it, it is a bit subtle actually, uh, but it's really not important uh, for this. Um, it doesn't change, it doesn't change the Hamiltonian constraint. Like um, when, uh, when, um, What's his name? When DeWitt wrote the Hamiltonian constraint, he did not know about the given talking term. Nothing bad happened. Okay. Yeah. But, but, um, yeah. We can come back to it. It actually, <laughs> it will subtly show up a bit later, but, but it, 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 it's not a big deal actually at this point. But it's a good question, um, which I did get confused about also at some point. Um, uh, just a, yes. The question. So the, the K dot is del R K. K, K dot, sorry. K dot is uh, a radial derivative. Of K. Yes, but I, I'm I'm that's right. But yeah, at, okay. just at the moment, the way I've written this metric, mm -hmm. um, it's sort of like they would in in quantum cosmology or something. R is a is a time like direction. Yeah, yeah, just checking. Yeah, thanks. So so I'm I'm I'm. This is got what I'm first going to get, but it really doesn't matter. We could have put a plus in front of this n squared and a minus in front of the dt squared. And uh, it, it would all be fine. But yes, it's a radial. That's that's right. If you're thinking about, that's right. Sorry, thank you. If we were doing the exterior, it would be a, it's a radial time direction. That's right. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So this is the the Hamiltonian constraint as as written down by ADM and Dewitt and all kinds of people. And indeed, if we were in the exterior, it's the Hamiltonian constraint for the radial flow. Uh, that that's correct. Yeah. Um, everyone happy? Okay, so now what well, let's solve this. And so this is where the Hamiltonian Hamilton Jacobi bit comes in. So in Hamilton Jacobi theory, what do you do? You write down the equation of motion in with in terms of momenta, and then you let pi k be ds dk and pi v be ds dv. Right, you introduce this, whatever it's called, Hamilton's principal function or something like that, where S is a function of K and V. And you but, plug those into here, and then you get the hmm. Hamilton Jacobi equation, which is ds dk squared plus V squared ds dv squared plus 16 V squared equals zero. Um, so, 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 sorry, so I'm trying to get uh, just a question. Uh, it, it's not, not relevant to the technical the derivation you're going to prove. Oh, sorry, is that another question? Okay, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, it's not, not relevant to the technical derivation you're going to do. You'll get the spot shell metric, but I just wanted to ask this thing of doing things in the inside, maybe it's related. I should have asked it earlier as well. Uh, if you're doing things outside, there is really some Cauchy slice you can draw, which is just completely outside the horizon. Yeah, That's I'm not doing good. Let me, good. no, no, this is important. So let me, let me insert a parenthesis here to, to explain what I'm doing and what I'm not doing. This, okay. this is a conceptually important point. Yeah. So, so here's your ADS swatch out. What has been widely discussed, uh, you take slices that go across like this, and right. you can evolve them. And and you know at late times, uh, you might get a slice. Like if you're here, your slice is in the interior. Okay, ah, mm -hmm. those are Cauchy slices. That's that's the more normal ADS CFT, just the right way to do things. Okay, right. I'm doing something different. I'm um, exactly so. One one way to get the interior. Uh, is to consider these kind of slices and take the late time limit t goes to infinity, okay? Right. And then the late time slice, you naturally think of it as living in the in the, the the causal diamond is the is the interior. I'm doing something different. I'm going to be doing. I'm going to be considering right. this, and then I'm continuing it like that. Right. And and for the slices inside, uh, yeah. So the thing I was worried about was the boundary conditions that you need to put at r equal to zero. You're saying will not somehow matter. I mean, maybe this is related to the given Hawking. Yeah, yeah. There's a given Hawking. If you, you should, if if yes, that that's what people. So when, in fact, that's what Gibbons and Hawking probably. <laughs> I mean, so so when you when you obtain the Hartle Hawking state or something, you, that yeah, it's more like you're putting it at the future. Well, it's not a boundary condition, right? It, it, um, yeah, I was just wondering that these slices at the point that there's one point where they all intersect the singularity, right? Which is this, which like is, this one. Yeah, there may be subtleties there that I'm not gonna that don't appear in this sort of co-homogeneity one analysis, but may, may be relevant. Uh, I, I absolutely 
that's 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 correct. I have not thought in great detail about about this point, and uh, it may be relevant. But I, okay. I don't think it's relevant here. But um, going forward, you you could def yes, you could you you could definitely think about that. Yeah. Okay. I, okay. Thank you. I, I I I agree. But yeah, it's important to distinguish like this from from this. That's why I went through this motivation. Okay, so I started off thinking about this came from this sort of what does it mean to continue the RG flow through the horizon, and that that leads you into this kind of slicing instead of these these slicings. And you see something that there is something there will be a payoff for this. Okay, which we'll we'll come to in a minute. All right, so this was the but at the moment we're, we're doing very low tech classical things. This is the Hamilton Jacobi equation. Now. I remind you what you're supposed to do with the Hamilton Jacobi equation to get the classical solution. You're supposed to find a general solution that has a constant of integration in it, a non-trivial one, not just a shift by S. Then you differentiate with that with respect to that constant and you set it equal to another constant and, and that gives you the solution. So you can solve. So solving uh, Hamilton Jacobi, you find S of V and K and some constant of integration that I'll call K0. And this is 4v sine k plus k0. Okay, you just solve it, and that's the solution. That's the general solution uh, with one constant of integration, which is what you need. Then to find, given the Hamilton Jacobi solution, to get the classical space time, you should do what you do in classical mechanics, which is you differentiate the Hamilton Jacobi uh, function with respect to the constant, and you set that equal to a second constant. Okay, so now there are two constants. So the solution to Hamilton Jacobi only has one. This is going to be important later, but the classical space time, of course, they come in pairs. And so there are two constants. So if you take this solution, you plug it into here, and then you can solve for V, you get V in terms of epsilon over four, that turns out to be a sect. K plus K zero. Just to to maybe connect to something. This is the volume, okay, in terms of the shape, and uh, K goes to minus infinity is the horizon. K goes to plus infinity is the singularity. The volume is zero at the at the singular sorry at the horizon and at the singularity, and it has a maximum, and that's what this curve describes, and and so. What's really nice about this, so this is in fact, we'll, we'll see in a second Schwarzschild ADS, uh, but what's very nice about this is this is a purely relational description of Schwarzschild ADS. There's no, there's no coordinates involved. There's no T and X or anything. It's one metric component as a function of another metric component. Okay, and that's quite nice. If you want to go through horizons, you, you might not want to use the T coordinate uh, but the metric is totally it's a, it's coordinate independent in some in some sense. That's what I mean by relational. So it's like if, if I have a motion of a particle, okay, you could uh, give its position and its momentum in terms of t, or there's a more intrinsic definition where you just give the momentum in terms of the position, right? And that's that's more like what this is, right? It, it relates two metric components without giving them both in terms of time, and that's a classical version of the Wheeler DeWitt equation being timeless. Okay, there's no so we can say this is it's, uh, timeless. Okay. There's no, it's not about how things evolve in time. It's that if you know the shape of the, if you know the shape of the slice that you're on, you know its volume. Okay, but you don't have to say what time you're at, and that happens. Okay. Sorry, sorry, I have a question. Yes, please. Uh, by saying that the volume uh, becomes very large at the similarity, what exactly do you mean? Uh, it, it goes to zero. It goes to zero. This is the this is the oh. spatial volume. This is the it's the spatial volume, and and sec is uh, one over cosh, and so as k goes to infinity, it goes it goes. So that this volume in the interior. So v is the volume of these spatial slices, right? Which uh, so it's the Einstein Rosen. It's the well, it, it's the volume of these slices, and they go to zero here. They go to zero here, and it has a, a bump, has a maximum. There's an extremal slice. Some of you may know inside inside uh, horizons and and that's where the volume reaches its maximum um, I, 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 I I have a question I'm confused about something so so this 
uh, it's okay to call this radial wheel de equation, right? Uh, what the, the, the which the 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 wheel of the width? Did you say the radial? It's it's okay to call it, it radial because uh, we're we're only looking at radial dependence. Yes. Um, okay, but uh, so uh, am I correct to understand that the sign of the lapse function is is changing uh, because we're doing? Well, both I haven't done that yet. So so all, all I'm talking about so far. Yeah. Is the interior. Right. And and we're doing this. Now just hold, hold 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 your horses and and we'll 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 talk about changing the sign of things in in two minutes. I see. So, yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. But yes, the, the well, the lapse also doesn't appear here, right? By the way, this this is just v and k, neither of which are the lapse. Right? The lapse was n, uh, which its role in life was to 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 impose this constraint. Okay. Now we we the lapse is still there. So so indeed, if you want so. In principle, you should stop here. And, and for the wheeler dewitt equation, this is all you need. But if you want to reconstruct the full classical space-time, as we would normally talk about it, so so to show that this to convince you that this really is Schwarzschild out ADS, right? Might might not be obvious written like this. Uh, you can change coordinates. And I don't know if it's very useful to write this down explicitly, but you 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 write k in terms of some other function z. It's just, a, it's just a change of variables. I won't write it down. It's very simple. And then you also should solve for n. n has an equation of motion that you can get from the from the from the Lagrangian, and you'll find uh, ds squared is one over z squared minus f of z e to the minus two k zero dt squared plus dz squared over f of z plus dx squared plus dy squared, um, where f of z is one minus epsilon zero e to the k zero over two z cubed. Okay, and so f is negative in the interior. Okay, so this, there's, there's an extra minus sign. Right, so this is Schwarzschild ADS and planar, planar Schwarzschild ADS. Okay, uh, and there are the two constants of integration that we found one of them is the mass of the black hole, epsilon zero, and k zero is sort of the normalization of time. Okay, and that, that's why they're conjugate, right? One's sort of a time, and the other one's an energy. Okay, so this is this is so what I've just shown you here is how to get Schwarzschild classical Schwarzschild ADS, not by solving the Einstein field equations, but by solving the Hamilton-Jacobi equations. And once you've got this, it's pretty clear that this form is valid both inside and uh, outside. Uh, the horizon. So this is valid in the interior and the exterior. Um, and if we wanted now this choice, this, this parameterization in terms of V and K was sort of physically clear, but it's actually not a good one for going through the horizon. And so we could also use, so instead of V and K, we could have used, possibly should have used, GTT and GXX, right? So there's there's a one-to-one -one relationship between, so GTT, I'm sorry to keep going up and down. Um, let me just change the color. So GTT would, is this thing here, right? V to the two thirds times E to the four K over three, that's equal to GTT. And similarly, GXX is, is that prefactor. Right, so we could have written down the the Hamilton Jacobi uh, in terms of that language, and there S, the Hamilton Jacobi function turns out to be this, which I'm writing down. You'll see why in a second. So it's just linear in GTT has a very simple dependence, and the relational solution is written like this. Okay, so this is a this is the relational form of ADS Schwarzschild, right? It gives you a relationship between GTT and GXX on any slice, okay? And this is the, the, the Hamilton-Jacobi function and notice linear in GTT. So in, within Hamilton-Jacobi theory, going from inside to outside the horizon is just changing the sign of GTT. And whether it's positive or negative as per the question, it's not the lapse function, right? It, it's one of the metric functions. It changes sign as you go from uh, inside to outside, 
And there's no analytic continuation involved. This is just a linear function of GTT, all right? And so that one possible lesson, I'm not entirely sure how important it's gonna be, but if you if these, these slices going through the horizon within Hamilton-Jacobi theory just corresponds to GTT being positive or negative, so that, that seems fairly innocuous. Whilst if you want to use the actual T, the T coordinate, if you, if you continue T through the horizon, you have to analytic, analytically continue it, right? So T becomes T plus I beta over two when you go, when you go through, through a horizon. And, and, that, and so when you, when you look at Green's functions on, as, as people like Schenker and, and et al did you know, 20 or so years ago, if you want to look at Green's functions of the boundary theory as a function of time, and you want to use those to probe the interior, you have to analyt analytically continue these Green's functions, which is a bit, a bit subtle. But this stuff as a function of GTT rather than T, uh, it seems that going through the horizon is, is simple. Okay. Right, so yeah, GTT. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah just, 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 uh, just uh, about this, this point. Uh, so what does it suggest uh, about the uh, interior dynamics in terms of boundary field theory? I mean, no, <laughs> no, no, wait a second. We, we're getting there. We, we haven't answered this question yet. Okay, just uh, hold, hold on for 10 minutes. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I also, just, just to follow up to my previous question, so the, the, the question about lapse function was more about GRR. Uh, so it's, it's, yes. it's still true that, that in terms of the lapse function, I'd have to think the lapse function is, is becoming imaginary or something, right? That, that still holds. Well, I mean, it depends if you, if you square yeah. it or not. I mean, you don't have to square it, but, but GRR is, of course, also changing sign uh, across the horizon, yes. Yeah, and, and GRR is lapse function squared. So no, no, you're absolutely right that n squared would 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 yeah. n squared has to change the the coefficient of dr squared has to change sign. Yeah, but I'm saying you're, whether you write that as n squared or n is, is a little bit up to you. Sure, sure, sure. But it's still correct to say that 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 thing is changing sign or phase. Yes, absolutely. Okay, I see. Yes, 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 it is. Yes, all. all uh, absolutely, and actually, I don't want to underplay that. All, all I'm saying is that within this, this so within howard Jacobi theory, this is the equation. This is the key, the key function. Okay, this howard Jacobi function, and it goes through the horizon very simply. That that that's all. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. I have a question. Yes, please. So uh, you're saying that. Uh, I mean, how is all this related to the Einstein's equations and solutions to the Einstein? Because all geometries are ultimately to come from the Einstein's equations, right? If, if your geometry is not compatible with the Einstein's equations under consideration, then what is the interpretation? So there's a Hamiltonian formulation of, of general relativity. So that's equivalent to Einstein's equations. And there's a Hamiltonian constraint in that formulation, which this is a special, this equation here is a special example of the Hamiltonian constraint. Okay. And it's, I, I'm not aware that it's done very often, uh, but you could solve the full, you could in principle imagine formulating the whole Einstein equations in terms of how much Jacobi, look, how much Jacobi is an equivalent formulation of dynamics. Okay. There's nothing, there's no assumptions. There's nothing new. It's just a different way of formulating it. And so what I'm showing you is here is how you do it when you just have functions of one radial variable. But even if you want to consider full and homogeneous GR, uh, you, you, you could set it up in a Hamilton Jacobi framework. And this is what you would do. It's just a different way of formulating Einstein's equations, but it's equivalent classically. I see. Yeah. So every every you you write if you could solve the Hamiltonian constraints in generality for some function of s, of course, it'd be a massive function. Those solutions, and then you would do this step that I do here. Those solutions will be in correspondence with solutions to the Einstein equations. So it's 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 equivalent, except I'm arguing that for going through horizons, it's 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 maybe nicer than what we normally do because this coordinate t is not appearing. There's no coordinates, just the metric functions. Uh, good. So once again, so GTT goes to plus infinity. Sorry, uh, minus infinity of the boundary. And GGT goes to plus infinity at the singularity, and it goes through zero at the horizon. 
and how are these uh, k and v related to the uh, envelopes that you have shown that you have drawn i mean yeah are... so i saw that here. so it's it's something like yeah maybe i shouldn't have introduced these the, 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 okay so v e to the k over three is gtt v to the two over three e to the minus two k over three is gxx okay? so that's a change of variables but not nothing nothing fancy it turns out the equations are a bit nicer in these variables, but these ones are a bit more transparent. These are the these are the nice ones. Okay. All right. So classically, once again, the the this s of gtt and gxx and and a constant k zero contains all the information about the solution, and it you know goes through the horizon without too many subtleties. Right. So if we if we consider this with, again with GTT going from infinity to minus infinity to infinity, uh, you get the whole interior and exterior of of Schwarzschild ADS. Yes. Okay. Now let's go. Now let's look at the quantum. Now let's connect to what I started talking about: is partition functions and, and wave functions. And so the wheeler wheel equation is a canonical quantization of the Hamiltonian constraint. And so in our case, that means we take the Hamiltonian constraint and pi k now becomes i d d k and pi v now becomes i d d v. Okay, and so the wheeler de witt equation is then d squared k and, and then we introduce some wave function psi as the function of k and v. Could also be gtt and gxx. Okay, Does, doesn't, doesn't matter. Uh, psi minus v dv um, v dv of psi plus six uh i forgot a one there sorry no i didn't nope, nope, nope. momentary confusion I'll write down the right equation for you yeah 16 sorry yeah, 16 uh, v squared psi is zero okay this is the wheeler dewitt equation there is, of course, some ordering ambiguity when you uh, upgrade operators to, sorry, uh, functions to operators. It's not a big deal within the semi-classical limit, and I've used some canonical choice here. Okay. But it, it's not it's not relevant for for this story. Okay, so this is the Wheeler DeWitt equation, and um, so this is supposed to give you the way you think about this equation, right? Is that it's a it's a wave fun it's a function of slices, right? So you have these different possible slices in the interior, right? And um, this function is supposed to give you the probability that you find yourself on a slice with a certain value of k and v, right? So probability of finding a certain spatial metric uh, if you were to measure the universe you're in. Yeah, so it's a, it's a function of slices. So psi, like psi of g i j, right? It's a function of slices. Okay, so now this wheel of the wheel equation is in most contexts not a microscopic theory of gravity, right? You should just think of it as a semi classical quantization of, 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 of gravity. And so you should only really look for semi classical solutions. The way you find semi classical solutions is to set psi equals e to the i s. You plug that in here, and s, of course, obeys the Hamilton Jacobi equation. Okay, so from our solution to the Hamilton Jacobi equation before, we already have the solution, the semi classical solution to the Wheeler DeWitt equation, right? We take this function, this one, for example, right? This S, or the, or the equivalent one uh, for a function of V and K, it's this guy, right? It has one constant of integration, um, and that, that becomes this solution. Right, so using out the fact that we already solved the Hamilton Jacobi equation, we have the wave function as a function of uh, v and k, and this constant of integration is e to the i s v and k and k zero. It turns out, funnily enough, that in this case, this is actually an exact solution uh, to the wheeler dewitt equation, but that that won't happen uh, most of the time. This is like it's a WKB, right? So think of this as a WKB 
wave function. Now, what do you do in quantum mechanics when you have a series of WKB wave functions that are labeled by momentum, right? Which is essentially this K0. Uh, to build the general solution, you make a wave packet out of them, right? And so the general solution within this mini superspace where everything just depends on, on, one, on one coordinate. So you have the general solution, you build a wave packet out of these solutions. So let's call that TK bar. That's what we're integrating over. You have a general envelope beta of K bar, E to the I S V K. I'm calling it K bar instead of K zero for a reason that'll become clear in a second, right? So this is the general solution. And this is really important. Uh, Super uh, emphasized a very similar point when he gave a talk in Cambridge a couple of weeks ago. There's not one solution to the Hamilton Jacobi, uh, sorry, to the wheel of the wheel equation, right? The, the Hartle Hawking state is one solution. But there are many solutions. It's a partial differential equation. It lives in infinite dimensional space. It has a lot of solutions. Okay, within this restricted framework of space times that only depend on one variable, this is the general solution to the wheeler de Witt equation, and it depends on an arbitrary function uh, which you build wave packets out of. And just to emphasize, it is really important to be able to build wave packets. Let's ask: How do you recover the classical? Um, Schwarzschild ADS solution from, from this, these quantum solutions. And that's equivalent to something that you may, you should already know, right? Suppose when you solve, when you do a WKB approximation in, in some potential, right? You find, you find these plane, highly oscillatory plane waves, right? But classically, what you have, you have a particle rolling back and forth in that potential. And so to find the particle, you'd better build a wave packet because the particle is localized in space, right? It's not, a, it's not a beam. And so you have to build a wave packet. Okay, so to recover a classical uh, solution, you have to build a wave packet. Okay. So for example, actually I'm not gonna, given the time, I'm not gonna write it down explicitly. Well, actually, okay. yeah. beta, for example, could be something like this. Um, could have a phase, it could be a Gaussian. Right, this would be a Gaussian wave packet, right? It's got to build a wave. I've got a Gaussian. Um, um, this is where K0 comes in. So this, this is a wave packet that's peaked on K equals K0, and I have a phase. That's what a wave packet has, right? A peak and a phase. If you plug this into here and a large epsilon zero you can do this integral by stationary phase. What is the stationary phase condition for this integral? It's precisely ds dk bar, right? That's the constant of integration that you are that you're integrating over, equals the phase, the, the, the saddle point of this, which is turns out is just epsilon zero. Okay. And so the classical equations of motion, which involve two constants, only arise as a saddle point approximation to the stationary phase approximation to the wave function. This is how quantum mechanics uh, always, always works. And so when you, so in this Hamilton Jacobi language, it's important to see that these two constants, and so what this packet does is it make, it forces you to evaluate at K bar equals K zero. Okay. It's a very sharply peaked wave packet. Uh, and so what this term does, it doesn't contribute to the stationary phase. What it does is it forces, uh, K bar to equal, sorry, where they start putting the bars on the bottom. K bar is K zero. Okay, so this is the classical solution. So to find the classical have, solution, yes. So uh, you're considering just radial functions. I mean, functions of R and T, right? Just R. But just R, okay. Yeah. So, but when, uh, when suppose, suppose the wave packet or whatever, uh, uh, the envelope that you're talking about or the slice that you're talking about enters the horizon is going to be, it's, it's going to uh -huh. feel the tidal this forces, is, right? This is not a particle. This is a wave packet. Yeah, wave packet. I understand. Yeah, but not of a particle of the metric, right? So there's no sure. horizon. It, this wave packet doesn't enter the horizon, right? This is just a wave packet. This is a wave packet of solutions to the wheel of the width equation. There's no horizon. Okay. There's, there's no so, horizon. I thought I thought you said that the time the slices they mm -hmm. they go from the idiot I mean the Schwarzschild 
it is boundary to inside the horizon, uh, right? Yes, yes. Uh, sorry. Uh, thank. Okay. At the we're not crossing the horizon. We, we're we're about to, but we haven't done that. So at the moment, what we're doing is we look. We've we've constructed a Wheeler DeWitt equation. The, so these these wave these these uh, this wave function you would would traditionally be thought of just as a function on these slices. Let's not cross the horizon yet, but we're, we're about to. Okay, but this wave packet, there's nothing about tidal forces is about a particle going through the horizon. That there's no particles going going through the horizon here, right? There's just this this is the space time itself. This 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 um, this wave packet. It's it's a wave packet where where you have many space times with slightly different energies, and you're super and you're building a wave packet out of them to pick out a preferred energy of the mass of the black. This energy is not the mass of a particle. It's the mass of the black hole, right? So if you want yeah, that that that's so. So just two two things related to your question. Firstly, we haven't crossed the horizon yet. Okay, we, we're just building. We've built a uh, a wheel of the width state that that describes the interior. Okay, and um, all that I'm saying is that even there, right? If you want to have your wheel of the width state localized on a single Schwarzschild ADS solution, as opposed to a superposition of Schwarzschild ADS solutions. You need to build a wave packet. Okay, that that's all. This is not a wave packet of a particle moving in the space time. It's a wave packet of space times. Uh, so, so Sean, I also have a question. I could have asked a few minutes earlier. Uh, so, uh, at some point, you inserted the wave wave function e to the i s, and then uh, you said s satisfies Hamilton Jacobi. Of course, yeah. when you act with the uh, full wheel debate operator and the quantum mechanical thing, you'll also get terms which has two derivatives acting on S. Yeah, of course. This is the leading semi-classical order. Yeah. I see. So, so for now, we, we you're just going to going to ignore those terms. Is, is that right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can include people. You can certainly, just like you do in quantum mechanics, you can systematically include. So, in fact, you know, in the paper, we we solve so two things. The set, it turns out that the WKB solution is actually exact on, on, on this potential. So, so it is actually the exact solution. Okay. Uh, but I just don't think that it makes sense to. Um, so, if, for example, the leading correction of these sort of determinants, right? And, and these determinants, you should definitely think about the inhomogeneous modes when, when you write down, you should look at all the fluctuations uh, about all the one loop fluctuations about them. So, at the leading order, you're just thinking about the classical background where it is reasonable. Certainly, let's say in a decider context, to think that the the, the 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 homogeneous modes are bigger than all the other ones, uh, in a black hole, that that's not such a good uh, thing to do. But 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 um, but certainly, once you start thinking about the fluctuations about the the saddle point, you should include the whole determinant, and then beyond that, you just shouldn't even go there because you know you you don't have a this is not a theory of quantum gravity, right? It's just a semi classical a semi classical quantization. Of course, if you're doing one plus one uh, stuff. That then, then you might get away with this. Uh, it, so the, the solution, yeah, right. That that, that makes sense. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I think I think I understand. Um, uh, okay. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, in some so this the, I didn't understand why e to the is was exact, but you're saying it is it is exact. Yeah, yeah. You take so you take yes, you you take you take this function. Uh, oh, you because it's this. linear or something. Is that is it? No, 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 no. It's it's a Schrodinger. It's it's it's, it's a. It's an exponential, but but this was, I think, known. This this potential has appeared, and this particular Schrodinger equation has appeared in other places. And so you take e to the i times this, you plug it in, and you get zero. It solves it, it solves the equation exactly. Okay. Um, um, I see. Okay. It, it's 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 bouncing off an exponential potential if you put it in a normal Schrodinger form, and and it it turns out that that WKB is exact. I see. Okay. Uh, this but exactly. Way, you know, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, just an organizational. We're not we're not very particular about time, so you can you can take take the yeah. Time. That that would be good because I definitely. Yeah. I mean, I I, I don't, I'm happy to stop whenever I'm told to stop, but but uh, yeah, yeah. No, no, you can you can. Go I, I would like to get to the sitter space, and it's that's going to take a little while. I mean, yeah. not 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 infinite amount of time, but but um, maybe twenty more minutes or, or something. Sure, sure, yeah, sure, yeah. sure, sure. No issues. Yeah. Okay. Good. Thank. Thank. Thank you. Um. So I, I really want to emphasize this wave packet thing, okay? Because that it, it's um, the way WKB solutions are, are plane waves, right? If you want to build a classical particle out of, you superimpose them. The analogous thing here, so this this solution, this 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 e to the i s of uh, v k k zero. If I fix k zero, 
this is a superposition of universe of ADS Schwarzschilds with many, many different values of the mass. Okay, that's maybe not what, if you want to have an ADS Schwarzschild solution with a single mass, you should build this wave packet and the wave packet will be peaked on this, on this, on, on, so the, the, so from quantum, basically, I think Hamilton Jacobi is much less mysterious if you, if you think about it coming from quantum mechanics. And so first you solve, the, you get the WKB solution, but then there's a second step to get the classical solution, which is to build wave packets. And that's where this, so these two constants of integration don't appear on the same footing. Okay, one of them is a constant of integration, the Hamilton Jacobi equation, and the other one arises when you make wave packets. Of course, you can swap their roles, okay, but the the two phase space coordinates appear appear asymmetrically. Okay. Uh, um, yes. So I had another question. Uh, you know, you have these uh, these uh, uh, solutions which are superpositions of Schwarzschild. Uh, now uh, here here you haven't crossed the horizon, but in fact there is some ADM Hamiltonian outside. Uh, which can uh, measure the mass of this watch child solution. Yes, we're, we're getting there. I promise. Give give me two okay. five minutes. Yeah, we'll, right. we'll we'll so so let's just be so at the moment what we've been doing is sort of textbook uh, quantum cosmology. Okay, a la a la nineteen eighties. Okay, I, I mean in slightly different setting, but but this is how it's mini super space built the wave packets. Okay, um, this is what what you should do. Okay. Um, Okay, so now though, let's 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 go out through the through. Uh, sorry, let me see. Do I want to say anything else? Sorry, sorry, I, I have another question. Please go ahead. Uh, I mean, uh, is the understanding that the various solutions, the various solutions to the wheeler dewitt equation, are the kind of geometries that a black hole evolves from, say, zero. I mean, from uh, from no black hole to a black hole. Is that the interpretation? Well, there's no evolution involved, right? This is a timeless, this is just the state of, of, of you have some, in general, you'd have some causal diamond, but it's like this interior, okay? And there's just a wave function. I'm, I'm gonna, not gonna, there's, there's some subtlety about what you mean by probabilities in this context, but just putting those aside, it's essentially, it's a wave function whose norm squared essentially would give you the probability that you find yourself in a certain, uh, Spatial metric. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean. Uh, but wait, wait one second. So, so if if you didn't build the wave packets, yeah. then uh, so if you just look at this guy, uh, you could find yourself in in certain slices. Okay. And v and k. So to re actually relate v and k, or maybe gtt and gxx, gtt and gxx only get related to each other on a slice when you fix the mass of the black hole. If you take this state, and so if you build a wave packet where the mass of the black, where epsilon, where this constant of integration is, is being fixed, then whatever you measure, you're always going to find that GTT and GXX are not independent because they're related by the classical equation of motion for a given mass. If you do not build the wave packet, then you could measure all GTT and GXXs that could be related by different by different masses. The mass is not fixed. Right? So it's not a so yeah, by by wave packet you mean something that is centered on some specific metric on some specific geometry. That's correct. Right? Yes. Okay. Yes, and, that's correct. Uh, but before and, you build, it's not that it's arbitrary. So some of the a lot of the structure of the solution, basically exactly. So in Hamilton Jacobi theory, the solution is built in two steps. First, you have to find this solution, this this function s, and second, which depends on uh, one constant of integration. That's step one. And step two, you introduce a second constant of integration uh, by doing that. Okay. And, and, and so to get a full classical space time, like a solution to Einstein's equations, you have to do both steps. Uh, and if you only do this step, it's a, it's a superposition of solutions to Einstein's equation. Still, you have the solution, you've solved an equation, right? It's not an arbitrary space time that you're superimposing, it's a superposition of solutions to Einstein's equations where one of the constants of integration hasn't been fixed yet. In this case, the mass. And in that case, what, what becomes the interpretation of the wheeler dewitt wave function? Because it's just e to the s, k not. Well, it's like, it, it's, it, so the, anal the an anal analogy for a particle, you could say, what's the, suppose you solve, you have a potential, you have a particle moving in a potential, you, do a w, you write down a WKB wave function. Right, that does that does have a constant of integration in it, right? Which could be the momentum of the particle. So 
that could be this, this would be one solution, this would be another solution. Okay, neither of those are classical particles, but they're both solutions to the Schrodinger equation. So before building the wave packet, you have a superposition of universes that are not localized at any particular point. Then you build the wave packet, then you have a particle that's actually rolling up and down the potential. That would be like the wave packet, which is like a universe. So a classical universe is like a classical particle rolling in a potential. These plane waves, so these, these kind of solutions, before you build the wave packet, are superpositions of universes, just as a WKB wave function is a superposition of many particles, many localized particles. Okay, maybe we can talk later because you're running out of time. Okay, yeah. So um, everything I'm doing here is the same as in quantum mechanics. It's just that the variables are metric functions instead of positions of particles. Okay, so that there's nothing exotic uh, happening uh, happening here. There's also some subtleties in the story about that I'm not going to get into about the plus and the minus sign and choosing a positive norm. Okay, very interesting points, but they're not they're not they're just not for today, given given the time. Okay, so in general, then you can um, let's focus on bef before we build the wave packets. We have a solution, and let's go back to GTT and GXXs because they're, they're they're better. Right, so we have a solution. A Wheeler, this is a Wheeler DeWitt wave function. It solves the Wheeler DeWitt equation and it depends on a single constant of integration. We haven't built the wave packet yet. In conventional quantum cosmology from the 1980s, this GTT would be positive uh, because, because it's a spatial slice. Right. So let's see. So the question about going through the horizon is I'm just going to take this wave function, it's completely explicit. And it's linear in GTT. Okay, it's a very trip. E to the i is, has a trivial dependence on, on GTT. And let's take. So what happens if GTT is allowed to be negative? Which what that corresponds to is not just considering these slices, but also considering these slices in the exterior where GTT is negative. Okay. The natural thing, and in particular, what happens if we then do this, and suppose we then also take GTT to minus infinity. So we're considering slices that are localized near the boundary of ADS. Okay. And in particular, if GTT gets big and goes to minus infinity. All right. So the natural thing to expect, so let's relabel this, it's going to be the same object. But when GTT is negative, it's, we suspect that it's more likely to be something more like a partition function. But note that it's labeled by this constant of integration still. And so by the, these partition functions, so if you want to derive the Wheeler DeWitt equation, for example, it's done in uh, Arthur and Hawking's paper, um, it's automatically obeyed by the path integral with, with, with where you fix it as a function of the slice. And that slice can definitely either be um, space-like or time-like. Okay, so this object, the, the partition function of ADS that we normally, well, <laughs> uh, there's going to be no double trace deformations in this talk. You, you may or may not be pleased uh, uh, to hear. Um, so this object obey, still obeys the Wheeler DeWitt equation. Okay, I'm going to call it Z, and we'll see why I'm going to call it Z in a second, but it's the same quantity. Okay, psi. I just take the solution, it's completely explicit, and we allow GTT to be negative in that, in that solution. It, classically, nothing went wrong when we did that. We just got the classical Schwarzschild solution outside the black hole instead of inside. And now we're doing the same thing, but for the semi-classical state, which is just e to the i times s instead of the classical. So I'm doing the semi-classical version of, of, letting G, of going outside the horizon. Okay. Here's what now this is going to relate to Suvrat's question about the energy. And so I think it is a bit nice what, what happens. Okay. So you can show everything is completely explicit, right? This S is a, a known function that ds dk0, that's this constant, right? So the z is e to the i and s. Uh, is which so this is minus i d log z dk0 uh, is equal to minus two i over three, two GTT, 
d log z g g t t minus g x x d log z g g x x. So this is just an equation that is obeyed by this function z that we have in our hands. Okay, it's a known function that came from solving the Wheeler to Witt equation, and and it happens to obey this. Why am I doing this? This thing is on classical solutions is going to be the energy. Okay, but it's not it's not yet because we haven't built a wave packet, right? So ds dk zero happens to be this. This is nothing but the momentum conjugate. Well, this quantity um, is the momentum conjugate to GTT. And so it's natural to write this in the following way as TTT minus TXX. Because this is the momentum conjugate to GTT. And then with both indices up, and then this GTT here lowers one of the indices. And so you get that. And similarly, this one becomes that. All right. Um, now let's take it all the way to the boundary. And this quantity uh, is just the energy momentum tensor of, 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 the, of the boundary uh, theory in the usual ADS-CFT holographic renormalization sense of the word. And so in the CFT, i.e. as GTT goes to minus infinity, uh, the, the trace has to be zero. This background is flat. Okay, the, the GTT and GXX are both constants. And so the trace of the intermediate potential is zero. Okay. And so using this, this just becomes minus gamma TTT. Okay. So when you go to the boundary, the derivative of, um, well, this derivative of the partition function with respect to this K0 is in fact the ADM, this is the ADM mass, which should not be too surprising because we know on the classical, when we build wave packets, this just becomes epsilon zero, which we saw right at the beginning is just the mass of the black hole. Sorry, yeah. but don't think it's one, one more thing, just in case, which is that GTT itself uh, at the boundary. So you can evaluate GTT itself in this uh, wave function should yes. also become uh, TTT. I mean, or at least the integral of GTT itself it should also give you the ADM mass. Because it's, 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 say that one more time. Uh, sorry, the integral of GTT itself, just the component of the metric. Uh, well, uh, maybe you need uh, to make some gate choice. Should also give you the ADM mass. Uh, so that should, shouldn't that also? No, well, I think, okay, so I'm maybe not sure what the in maybe integral of GTT minus the, the background, you know, it, I mean, I'm just saying the usual ADM formula would say that you look at the, uh, it would say you look don't, at the. Don't, don't you have to differentiate it? Yeah, because I think, uh, um, okay, I mean, to, the way I think about it is that the most, that there are many formulas for this ADM mass, but, but I mean, certainly it's, it's the it's the momentum dual to the met conjugate to the metric that, that I think is more naturally related to the to, to the to the mass. Right? It's the fall off, right? Uh -huh. So GTT near the boundary is going like, you know, um well, I wrote it down earlier. Uh, let's see. Uh, how's it going again? Uh yeah, yeah. Z squared yeah. one minus this mass Z cubed, right? As yeah. Z goes to zero. Right. And so exactly, exactly. The, is, so you pick up the sub Yeah, yeah, yeah which exactly. is which is more like the moment, the conjugate momentum. Uh, uh, oh, it's like your you, you, radial radial differentiation somehow. I mean, I, look, I, the way I think about it is, you know, the, the motion of a particle is x zero plus p zero t, right? And so the leading term is the position, and the subleading one is the momentum. I mean, it, that, that that this this guy is it is it is the momentum conjugate to 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 g at, at the boundary, which is, which is also, which is maybe this has to do with with the way you well, slice well, things because it, it, sorry, go on. Well, but you, you agree right, that, that here I'm, for example, uh, we all agree that this is the energy, right? It's this, it's this rotation value of TTT and TTT is, you know, DS to GTT, right? Which is a momentum. 
Uh, right, right. Uh, I was saying that uh, at least, you know, we also have an extrapolate dictionary, which is that you take the yeah, sub leading. This is. The one you have. Yeah, yeah. Um, I see. Um, and you, okay, so you're saying that uh, maybe this has to do with the way you slice things, because if you looked at a Cauchy slice, then the. Um, that that may that may be yeah this, this that 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 may well be so this is this is it in, in within this way yeah it's a momentum with respect to the radial slicing not not with respect to the time slicing that 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 may be important yeah yes okay 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 thank you I think this is a within a it's a fairly I don't think this is unconventional that there may be other ways of doing it but but um right it's just like the you know with fields right the leading the leading terms of yeah. ev the sub leading one is the the source. Sorry, the okay. leading one is the source, the subleading one is the VEV, which is of the operator, right? And and the dual operator. And so the dual op, which is like the momentum. Um, okay. Okay. okay, yeah, yeah. Um, so then, yeah, so then- um, So I, I have another nice yeah. question. Oh, yeah. Here you're assuming that Z is actually to be IS, right? No, so I've been, been defined S. to be. So this wave function, is was e to the i s, and I've just defined z to be the continuation of this wave function to negative g t t, and and it, it is just e to the i. I mean, uh, yeah, that's just what it is. Uh, so I mean, z is not really a thermal partition function or something like that. No, no, it's a there's, well, no, no, yeah, there's no temperature. It's a Lorentzian partition function. There's an i, okay. I see. And and there's definitely nothing thermal yet, because okay. uh, we haven't we haven't built the wave packet. So so yeah, this is so all um, right. Yeah. So so all all I'm trying to show you here is that um, this is what should have happened, I, I think, because because this this holographic RG flow also obeys the the the, the Wheeler DeWitt equation in a in a radial sense, and and when you go to the boundary, you you should. Um, yeah, you would have expected this to give you the mass, and 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 it does. Um, so this was meant to be a and a and one yes yeah one thing this about this k naught k naught uh, seems to be a kind of a time a boundary time right yes exactly but, but that's going to be but it's yeah, not but but it's, it's, not, but it's not exactly time right exactly no and this is going to be crucial uh, hopefully I'll mention a few things about this sitter at the end um, exactly so there's another time here. That is very, very. It's a it's a constant of integration in the in the bulk that is conjugate to the energy, right? Because constant of integration come in pairs, and in the wheel of the width state, it, it, it's 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 uh, it's like the normalization of time, but it's not it is not t. Yeah, exactly. That that's an important. So this thing has an object that is a lot like time, uh, but it is not the boundary time. It's a it's a constant of integration of the wheel of the width equation. Yes. Yeah. That that is an important point. Also, are you assuming that Z is, I mean, uh, what, how do you exactly, I mean, Z is defined in terms of S by a path integral, right? Uh, beyond, that's right, but I'm only being semi-classical here. And so I'm just writing as easy, but indeed beyond the semi-classical limit, there would be a path integral. That's correct. But, uh, yeah, but I'm, I'm only gonna work semi-classically for, for the moment. Um, uh, but even then, you would have some determinant terms which you have to take care of. I'm, that, classically okay. also. I'm uh, even more, even even uh, more classical. So it's still quantum in the sense that it's a wave function, but I'm just working at the e to the i s level, the leading 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 order, zeroth order, if you like. Because okay. this determinant, I think this determinant could and should be included, uh, but that will involve including all the inhomogeneous fluctuations and stuff in in the determinant. But I, I think it can be done. Uh, but I'm not. I'm not doing it. It's it's leading order semi classical. You could call that classical if you want, but it it is a wave function still. But in the presence of those fluctuations, wouldn't the uh, metric solution change from just radial dependence to dependence on the other parameters as well? No, there'll just be a determinant out the front. That that uh, no. So you you can so so you can so right. So this is how semi classical gravity works. You have a big space time. Right, which is let's say you look at a homogeneous solution, uh, and then if you want to include the quantum fluctuations, you have to include the zero point energy of all of the all of the uh, inhomogeneous modes. But you can still do that about a spherically or planar symmetric classical solution. Okay. So it, it yeah so it's, right yeah. 
So you can take a classical solution, let's say Schwarzschild, and then you can ask about the quantum corrections to that. And the leading quantum correction will be these, indeed, these determinants you're talking about. Um, but that doesn't mean it's inconsistent to consider Schwarzschild to start with. No, I was just concerned whether uh, this uh, this dependence on the fluctuations would de destabilize the solution altogether because you're assuming that it's a function of R and just R. And yeah, it'll be you... fine. No, no, it, it, it'll be fine. Well, we, this this is known. So 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 certainly in the exterior, Schwarzschild ADS is, is all positive specific heat and everything's fine. Now, of course, total singularity, these things will definitely be important. Um, and the solution yeah. will change, uh, but but in the, towards the boundary, it's it, it's it's fine. Okay. Um, good. Now, so this right now there is there's 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 there's, there's uh, one more important thing here before I talk briefly about the sitter, um, which confused when I was first doing this confused me a lot. There's one important this so this. Right, so if you go back to you know Witten's paper or whatever, right? One of the first things people did was evaluate the bulk, you know, the partition function, just at the same level I'm doing, the leading classical order partition function, and get the thermodynamics of the dual uh, CFT and stuff. Uh, but when when it, when that was done, there was a given a particular classical solution in the bulk with a particular mass. Okay, and here I have a partition function labeled by this k zero. Okay. And so let me just quickly connect. It's very instructive to see. So to, to, to recover a single classical solution, you have to build wave packets, as I told you, right? And let's put that in the language of these partition functions. And I think it's quite, quite instructive. Okay, so, but, so, okay, so what we just showed here was that um, ds dk0 near the boundary was the ADM mass, okay? Uh, so we just showed that yeah, minus I D log Z DK zero equals, uh, I'm gonna just call that H, the quantum field theory Hamiltonian. The ADM mass, which by the usual dictionary is the quantum field theory Hamiltonian. This implies that we can write uh, Z as trace of E to the I K zero H Q F T. Right, so this is the solution where trace is taking the expectation value. All, all the leading classical, all, all of the leading classical order. And so, um, so that that has to come back to a previous question. This is the sense in which k zero is like a time, okay? But it's not t, right? Um, so we can find the time from from the Wheeler DeWitt equation at a time. And so that also tells you what happens if you build this wave packet. So if we build a wave packet, for example, we build a particular psi that's some Gaussian wave packet um, of, of psi of k0, then, you could, then we do the same thing to z, right? We just extend the solution in, into the exterior. And that means we should integrate this against the Gaussian wave packet for K zero. I'll skip this in, in the interest of time, I'll skip the steps, but what, what you get is Z, uh, the wave packet was labeled by an epsilon zero and a K zero, right? Here we only have one constant, but when we build the wave packet, we have two. And what you find is there's a phase, it's not too important. And then there's a trace, and then we make the wave packet very narrow. So I'll just write it as a delta function instead of a Gaussian, but it, it's a it's a very strongly peak Gaussian delta of H Q F T minus epsilon zero. What is this? This is a microcanonical partition function. Okay, which I think makes complete sense. So in the wave in the Wheeler De Witt state, if you want to get ADS Schwarzschild with a particular mass, you build a wave packet focused on that mass. That wave packet extended to the boundary. The car this wave packet has a corresponding partition function. That partition function is the partition function of the dual CFT 
where the energy is fixed to a to us to, to the energy of the black hole. Right. So this is going to count the number of states in the CFT that has energy epsilon zero. Right. That's the microeconomical partition function. Okay. So the upshot of all this. Um, so this didn't quite answer the question that I had originally motivated, at least for myself, by, which was what is the interior in terms of the exterior? Okay. But it almost goes the other way around. It says if you have a Wheeler de Witt, every Wheeler de Witt state in the interior corresponds to a partition function of the boundary. Okay. And, and there are many partition functions because you can build different, different states. And what these different partition functions will correspond to is taking different averages over the energy, right? So a partition function is integral over energy, e to the minus um, uh, the energy times, I guess, i k zero. But then you can build, you have beta, you could build the wave packet corresponds to a different weighting of the energies in the trace, right? So when if we if we build a wave packet, this would be a microcanonical wave function. Uh, trace right this is the trace right the trace is an integral over all the different energy in, in a energy basis it would become this integral so once again the freedom to make different wave packets in the interior corresponds to different partition functions uh of the boundary theory and so the plane wave the plane wave state of the interior corresponds to this partition function which is labeled by a time and the wave packet uh, instead corresponds to a partition function that's more labeled by an energy. All right. Now, I'm so, I'm, um, let's see, yeah, people should just feel free to leave. I, I, I'll talk about the sitter, I'll keep it brief, um, but I, I should say a few things about the sitter. Please, I will not be insulted if uh, <laughs> uh, the squares start disappearing on the um, on the Zoom screen. So with this, so yeah, so we didn't, we don't, I'm not, I have not told you what the interior is in terms of the boundary, but I've told that states of the interior are in correspondence with different partition functions you can make of the boundary. That structure, so in, in the most, the more recent paper, um, we've applied this logic to the sitter. And the nice thing about that is that in the interior of Schwarzschild, you could start worrying about the Wheeler DeWitt equation close to the singularity, the, the you know, the, it's not a nice object. But in De Sitter space, the interior is very nice, right? The, the universe grows. Um, Severed and friends have told us how to, how to make sense of the Wheeler DeWitt equation uh, close, close to the boundary. Okay, so in the inside of, of, of the inside of, of De Sitter, um, space is very big, semi classic, should be totally fine. And so now what I want to do is take that wave function and continue it into the static patch. And I'm gonna argue that it gives you some static patch partition functions. Okay. And this connects this question of time, a lot of questions, you know, a lot of people interested in time in the sitter space, okay? And there is no time in the sitter space uh, in the static because you know, there's no boundary and, and so on. Uh, however, these Wheeler DeWitt equation, the solutions are labeled by a certain case, a certain number, and that will play the role of time very much analogously uh, to how it did here. Okay. So I'm saying the Wheeler-DeWitt equation is, I don't think this is a new statement actually, but it's one way to find a time is from the solutions to the, to the, to the Wheeler-DeWitt equation. All right, um, so I'll try to be brief. So, and I'm gonna look at Schwarzschild's the sitter, not just the sitter. Um, that Schwarzschild is nice for a couple of reasons. One is that when you put the black hole somewhere, it picks out a preferred static patch. That is the one that the black hole is sitting in the middle of. Uh, and also, if you want to build wave packets, you need some constants of integration. If you just write down the sitter, there is no constant of integration. Okay, it's just a solution, right? Whilst when you have Schwarzschild to sitter, there's a mass and you can build superpositions of, of Schwarzschild to sitter. So, um, the, the Penrose diagram looks like this, right? There's his his future the future infinity. Uh, here's what I'm going to call the static patch. This is the these are the horizons of the black hole. Here's the singularity. I'm going to call this the cosmological interior. 
which is a perverse name if you want to think of square plus as very fundamental because it's sort of the exterior in that sense. Okay. But if we're taking this more static from the static patch point of view, uh, then I'm going to, anyway, I'm going to call this the cosmological interior. So I think I'll avoid writing down too many equations because it, it's very, very parallel to what I did before. So the strategy goes as follows. First, take these kind of take these sli slices like this in, in, in the interior. So oh, maybe I'll write that down. Minus n squared dr squared plus gtt dt squared plus r squared d omega squared. So this is a two sphere, right? And t is time. This is the static patch time. So time is slices like this. It goes like this here, but it goes like this there. And this radial direction is time in the inside and the radial direction in the static patch. Solve the Wheeler DeWitt equation here. Psi is e to the i s of gtt and r. Big R is the size of the sphere. Okay, it's not the radial coordinate. You find the solution. You find that it depends on a constant of integration c, which is very much very much like k zero before. Okay. And so this you can again, and actually once again it turns out the WKB solution is exact. Okay, so that this is the solution to Wheeler DeWitt, where S is this Hamilton Jacobi function. Uh, and it's a function of GTT and R and a constant of integration C. Is everybody happy with, with this? Okay, is anyone not happy? Uh, any questions? Well, 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 I have something to say because. You see, I mean, when you are saying that it's an exact solution to the wheeler dvd equation, what exactly do you mean? Because uh, I mean, uh, within mini superspace, uh, of course. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, even in mini superspace, but uh, I mean, you are I mean, you are assuming you, you, a semi-classical solution, right? No. So I'm saying, if you you write down the wheeler dvd equation within mini superspace, so the wheeler dvd equation in mini superspace for these two variables is a Schrodinger equation for GTT, where GTT and R appear. So you're looking for a function of GTT and R. So differential equation for psi of GTT and R. I'm saying that if you take this, okay, where S is the Hamilton Jacobi function, and you plug it in to the Wheel DeWitt equation, it, you get zero. It solves it. That you're not doing an expansion. Normally, solutions of this form are only valid to leading order in an expansion in H bar or M Planck. But this happens to be an exact, I don't think it's a very important fact, but it, it happens to be uh, an exact solution in, in this case. So it's like, so okay, what it, what it corresponds to in more familiar terms, it turns out that if you solve the Schrodinger equation with an exponential potential, the WKB solution is, ex is exact. It's the same statement. Okay. Well, something like, I'm, I, I, yeah, I believe it's next. There's a particular exponential potential, which actually is familiar, actually, from the C equals one model. Uh, so actually, the same Wheeler DeWitt equation has appeared in the context of uh, two dimensional string theory. And, and, it, and it happens to be exactly solvable. Okay, so I mean, Witten has recently written a paper, uh, I think in December or somewhere, where he talks about the Wheeler DeWitt equation and he shows that on top of a term involving the conformal factor, there, there are some terms which can be interpreted as TT squared, T squared deformations, TT bar deformations. Yeah, yeah. I'm not doing any TT bar or anything. So, so what, 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 with maybe what one should think about the connection between what I'm doing and, and this T squared. Um, and I, I know Witten's paper quite well. Uh, this, um, I'm just solving the wheel of the wheel equation a la 1980s. Okay. That, that, that's, and, and what, what is being, New is how I'm trying to interpret it in terms of a, a partition of a corresponding partition function. See, the, the problem in you know DSCFT, right, is that there's no time. Okay, the wheel to wheel equation doesn't have a time and there's no Hilbert space, and so it gets a bit confusing. But if you can make a correspondence between wheel of the width states and partition functions, the partition functions do come with states and counting and you know nice stuff. And so that's the kind of correspondence that that I'm trying to make related to Witten's paper, we are in, in a minute going to talk about um, 
York time and 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 stuff. But there are no TT bar. There. In my mind, TT bar is various, which is certainly a nice story and, and all that. But but it's really about starting with something that you like, which is a CFT, and then trying to impose a Dirichlet condition as you go in. Okay, I'm not really imposing any Dirichlet conditions. I just have a it's, it's a it's a it's a function of all of oops, sorry. It's a function of all of these slices. So I haven't seen a necessity yet to think about it in terms of T bar, T T bar, but but it, it may be a nice thing to do. Okay. Has spent it just yeah. Uh, I just wanted to request in the uh, since it's a bit late uh, that we have questions at the end of the talk now. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I'm sorry for. Oh, yes. 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 I, I. Yes. Indeed. No, it's it's not your fault. <laughs> I'm just addressing everybody else. <laughs> So wait, what do you want me to do? Do you want to just stop? I just just stop. No, no, you just continue your talk. I want to hear what you have to say. And after that, uh, people can oh, 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 I'm sorry, postpone the questions. Yes, I'm sorry. Okay, yes, good. yes, that's what I yes, said. Yes. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm just, no, no, no. Oh, no, 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 no. No, 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 that's, that's, don't, don't worry, Spencer. That, that's, that's great. Okay, so. <laughs> um, Maybe we can shift the questions to the last end. Then. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, very good. That, that's what I meant. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, so um, let me see. So where was I? Uh, right. Um, good. And so, and indeed, so S solves the Hamilton Jacobi function, uh, is the Hamilton Jacobi solution. And if you set M equals uh, DC DS, as it turns out, it's a minus sign, not, not very important. This ends up being so the, so this is the corresponding stationary phase solution. Uh, you you get um, Schwarzschild sitter. Okay, so the same way that we we derived uh, uh, ADS Schwarzschild using Hamilton Jacobi, you can also do the sitter Schwarzschild, and you can start with so, so these solutions to the Wheeler DeWitt equation know about ADS Schwarzschild when you do when you build a wave packet and uh, do the stationary phase uh, like 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 this. Okay, very good. So. So these, these are, again, 1970s, 1980s, Wheeler DeWitt solutions in slightly different slicing, okay? But, but they're, they're still the same thing. And so now you could ask, this is a completely explicit function, what happens when GTT, if I let GTT become negative? Um, and so by analogy to ADS, but now it's, you know, it's less clear what, what we're doing. And so again, here's, this is the interior. This is where these, these Wheeler DeWitt equations live. I'm just going to move them when GTT becomes negative. I'm moving into some slices on the static patch here. Okay. And I'm going to postulate they become some kind of partition function. Uh, actually, it's a family of partition functions, right? Because they're labeled by GTT and R, right? So for every GTT and R, you get a you get a partition function. Um, right. So postulate that there exists a family of Hamiltonians. H of GTT and R, um, right? Such uh, such that this this guy is related is related such that okay okay very good such that uh, let me get it right. Um, the expectation value of the Hamiltonian is ds dc. Actually, the minus where this is minus d log z dc okay so let me let me just unpack that so if you remember previously uh we found some solutions uh in, in by previously i mean in ads we found some solutions that depended on gtt so there's some lag for some reason gxx and and k0 right and i called that z when i was outside the horizon and uh, dz dk0, we showed was the ADM mass, right? So I'm postulating the, the expectation value of it in some dual theory, right? And so I'm postulating that there exists a dual theory that has a Hamiltonian that lives on these world tubes 
One of these is a, is a tube, right? It's a, it's a sphere of radius r of the GTT, such that the expectation value of this Hamiltonian is the derivative of this partition function with respect to iron. Okay, so this, this defines C is the time, just like K0 was the time before. Okay, all right. Um, so uh, let me see. Um, and so very explicitly, yeah, um, I just wanted to, don't want to take too long. Um, what's the most basic thing? I'd say three things. So the we have this s, okay, we know s as a function of gtt, r, and this constant c. Um, and so using it, you can verify that s minus 2 gtt pi tt, that's the conjugate momentum, that's ds gtt, is equal to c ds dc. Okay, that's just a property that s that S obeys. So uh, this I want to interpret as C times H, okay? And so the partition function, which is E to the I S obeys that if we subtract off this guy is E to the I C H expectation value. And semi-classically, I want to think of that as just trace e to the i c h. So this was again the wave function psi. So this is the wave function, and it turns out you have to subtract off uh, this this piece. All right. So if I want to, if I want to interpret the wave function as this partition function, which is what I want to do, uh, you have to shift it by by this gtt at pi xx. So in terms of path integrals, what that's the, the, the proposal is that there exists a quantum mechanics with partition functions as a function of GTT and R, whose partition function is given by this gravitational object. The gravitational object, I'm going to, I mean, I'm only working semi-classically, but to make it look like ADS-CFT, let me write, introduce the path integral, e to the i integral over R of some Lagrangian up to some r star, where the metric at r star is just this guy, is given by gtt and r, right? So I'm fixing the boundary metric. Uh, and what this term is just a boundary term here, minus 2 gtt dl d dr gtt, that's the momentum. So these kind of boundary terms are not so unfamiliar in an ADS-CFT context. So I'm writing it like that to make it look reasonable. So this is a proposal, okay? There, so that the right dual object to think about is not a CFT, it's a family of Hamiltonians labeled by GTT and R. And what this is, this is being anchored in this, this conjugate, um, the fact that there's this solute, there's this constant C in the wheeler de Witt states that you can think of as a time and so its conjugate variable is like an energy. And we're posing that there's a Hamiltonian whose expectation value uh, in a given in, in some state is, is this energy. Uh, okay. So I don't, um, we know two things about this theory. I'll, I'll, I'll just say one of them. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip the black hole stuff, and I'll just say one, one, one nice thing about this theory. Okay, so what, what can we know? About these Hamiltonians. So, uh, it's natural, like an ADCFT, for these momenta, pi tt and pi r, so this is the momentum conjugate to GTTT to, to, to describe operators in the quantum mechanics. 
classically from the bulk equations of motion, we know these, right? This pi t t is just ds dg t t. Oops, sorry, I, this lag is a bit annoying. So if we know s, we know the momentum. Okay, it's a known thing, and it obeys the following. You can differentiate with respect to c, and you find that it's minus h plus some function of r that is, I won't write. In the quantum mechanics, c is becoming time, and this is becoming an operator. And so what this will tell you is that the in the quantum mechanics, the Heisenberg equation of motion, because h is conjugate to c, should be this. So there's this lag that is really killing me here. OK, I don't know. What, right. And so we learned the commutation relation between h and another operator, pi tt. You can do the same thing for pi rr. And then, and then there's one more commutator that's missing. I'm, being, I'm going to be very brief here. Pi tt and pi rr, you can basically get it from the Jacobi identity with some simple guess. It turns out that the algebra obeyed by these operators, h, gtt pi tt, and g and r pi r r turns out to be the following. And this will be the last point I make. If you define p to be h minus some function of r, that it's a c number. Okay, r is not an operator; just it's a it's a it's a background a number. You define x to be r pi r minus g t t pi t t, and you define d to be r pi r. It turns out that these three operators obey the following commutation relations. X, D is X, I, P, D is minus P, and I, X, P is some other function of R. And this is actually a known algebra, but it is not the SL2R. Okay, it's not your favorite uh, conformal algebra. What this is, is a central extension of the Poincaré group in one plus one dimensions. Okay. And, um, but a nice way to think of, so a simple way to get a representation of this algebra is to set, so this term here, right? So just to step back from what I did. So I proposed this follows more or less from the, the, the structure of the correspondence, okay? The proposed correspondence. We don't know the theory, all right? But I'm saying we know that it has this symmetry algebra. And so this is like, the high, this is a C number, right? So this is just like your canonical commutation relations. And then given that, D is, is like a dilatation, right? So you can take X to be X, P to be, you know, DDX, and then D is a half, xp plus px right so there are there there is a, a sense of there is a notion of dilatation uh in 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 this in this theory and curiously the dilatation operator is basically motion in the radial direction okay so it has a holographic flavor to it uh but it's not sl2r okay um yeah, it's a central extension of the for example this algebra arises i think the simplest context where it arises if you have a charged scalar field in one plus one dimensions, so a neutral scalar field would transform under the Poincaré algebra. If you charge it and you put in a background magnetic field, then P and X don't commute because of the background magnetic field and you get this algebra. So a charged scalar field in one plus one in a background magnetic field obeys this algebra. Okay, I think I should stop now because I have um, I've really I've really overrun, and so. The main message is that I think it's interesting to continue Wheeler the wave functions out of the causal diamond where they're defined through through the horizon, um, and in in ADS that seems to give you sensible answers in in terms of the boundary theory, uh, and in the sitter space it seems to want to define some Hamiltonians in the static patch that seem to have some interesting structure, 
Um, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. Okay, th thanks for listening and sorry for overrunning uh, so much. Hey, thanks, Sean, for the nice talk. So Sorry, and why R have to commute with X, pi, pi and G, R? But R is central. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I'm sorry, I went a bit quickly here. So the Hamiltonian is a function of GTT and R, okay? But these are numbers, okay? These are just numbers. But the Hamiltonian, so for a given GTT and R, so they, they label, the, there's a family of theories labeled by R and GTT. In each such family, there are at least three operators, H, pi TT, and pi R. It's very much like in ADS-CFT, there's a background GTT, but TTT is an operator, right? So GTT, in normal ADS-CFT, this is a background, it's not, it's not an operator, but it's conjugate TTT is, is the engine momentum tensor, which is an operator. So it's, it's analogous to that. So there are three, within this mini superspace, there are three operators. They depend on these background fields, but actually it turns out this algebra only depends on R, uh, it doesn't depend on GTT. Thank you. There are a couple of uh, hands raised. Uh, I think first is Arna. I have a question. Hi. Uh, uh, maybe, yeah, Spenda can go first. Uh, hi. Sorry, uh, I didn't want to interrupt, but I, I have to leave. So, uh, uh, a great talk, Sean. Uh, uh, just uh, one question is. Uh, you know, that in ADS-CFT, we have learned how to understand uh, uh, to a large extent the physics of the horizon of a black hole in terms of, you know, thermal field theories and hydrodynamics, et cetera. Uh, what would be the uh, signature of the black hole singularity, for example, in the way you did it? Perhaps there's some way in which... <laughs> yeah, that, of... Absolutely. That, that was my original motivation right at the beginning that... that... Um, but I, 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 so I don't have anything very useful to say in this direction. However, you, it, and this maybe does start connecting to some double trace thing or, or something that there might be. Okay, yeah, good. So um, I, I don't know. Is, is it, I, I think at the end of the day, I, I don't have anything on, on that question that is, that, is, that is useful. But what might be useful? So what is not okay? So what I think it turned out to be very tricky, right, was thinking about time and try to analytically continue time past the horizon. And I mean, in principle, it might make sense, but in practice, it, it seems very delicate. Okay, uh, you can think of the partition function of the theory as a as a function of its background metric, GTT. Right? That's I, what this all suggests to me is that this object as a function of GTT may know about the singularity in an interesting way. And it may be less violent. So you'll have to extend, you have to change the sign of GTT. So imagine taking the partition, imagine that you can exactly calculate the partition function of your field theory on an arbitrary or even just a constant GTT background. That partition function extended to GTT with the opposite sign has a chance of knowing about the singularity, I think. And and it, and it may be less unpleasant than analytic because it's just a it's, it, okay. There's a chance that it's less unpleasant. So actually, what I what I would be interesting that I is just to find a theory where you can really a holographic an interesting theory where you could actually evaluate this in closed form and just see what happens if GTT um, changes sign. That that that's a sort of a direction, but but I'm not going to promise it's going to work. But but that that's what it suggests uh, to me. Thank you. Thank you. I think there is a question by Arnab. Uh -huh. uh, hi, v very, very quickly, Sean. Uh, so uh, my question is about the ADS part also. Uh, uh, because uh, you have all this Willard Tivet equation, etc., there is some kalan Simanzik equation, I guess. Uh, so there is a notion of the RG flow still. So I was wondering, is there a way to uh, precisely think about or construct a central charge for this flow? Uh, which you know, as you reverse GTT. Wait, wait, sorry, I just no, no, I haven't quite followed. Let's see. So, are you um, when you're talking, are you talking about the RG flow here or here? What, 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 where, where, well, where? all throughout along the slices. So outside, uh, it's the slices that you draw. Yes. Oh, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Along those, and once you go inside, you you flow vertically. Mm -hmm. 
so 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 because uh, because you have basically the uh, the Wheeler Dewitt equation, uh, presumably there is some Kalan Simanzig equation there, and there is a notion of an RG flow. So I was wondering whether, and you're you're also studying the, the partition function in some sense, right? Outside it's a partition function. So if the partition function is evaluated at some uh, with in a, in a compact manifold. Uh, I mean, for example, the, the finite scaling size of the partition function could give us information about the central charge itself, right? So I was wondering whether there is a way to define the central charge as a function of the radial variable outside and as a function of... Uh, yeah, don't, don't you have a paper on this? Actually, wait. Uh, I, I, yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> okay. But I was so thinking... Maybe I, I you should tell me... Uh, uh, yeah, well, think, yeah, the, the, there, there it is something very simple there. It, it's just uh, the, the, the central charge function that you can construct outside. It just simply, if you analytically continue, because it's still a coordinate dependent description, if you just analytically continue inside, it, it still decreases monotonically. And uh, it's really very, very simple. But I was wondering whether this uh, uh, this Willard Dewitt equation. Uh, that's, that's interesting. Okay, yeah, that okay, wonderful. So what, like, okay, I don't. I mean, that's right. So recently, I, the way I'm thinking about it now is kind of the inside and the outside are are somewhat different. I mean, it's the same object, but it, I think we want to think about it a bit differently. So I mean, one. Okay, so the only thought that comes to mind based on what you said is that you could ask, what does the mono the monotonicity of the central charge mean in terms of the Wheeler DeWitt equation? Maybe it tells you something about the states, but is that you right? You're saying there yes. is some. Um... Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know what, what, how to say, how to describe it in terms of Wheeler DeWitt equation. Actually, what's a bit interesting there, in fact, is, is that related to, okay, I'm, I'm just free associating uh, this problem of time, in, in fact. I mean, because if there's some monotonicity, uh, uh, you know, hiding behind the Wheeler DeWitt equation, um, you know, may, maybe maybe that somehow picks out a direction of time or or something. I, I okay. Uh, yeah, I was wondering about that too, but, I'm uh, not but I, I don't I I don't know. Is it short answer? Um, okay, okay, but 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 I mean I mean so 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 you, could could you technically calculate this this object uh, not in not in a uh, let's say the uh, I mean you took the Poincaré ADS right I mean the flat direction but if I compactify the directions you can also do this calculation right yeah definitely in fact the 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 yes yes definitely the um in fact in this De Sitter case we did have a sphere and I, I I would assume that in ADS you could put it on a on a sphere too yeah I, I don't I don't think okay. it's a and and then the finite size scaling should give me the central charge uh, already at the boundary okay mm -hmm. right so uh, yeah, yeah I, I don't, I don't know. know i'm I'm just wondering whether that's a quantity that one can uh, track through this uh, yeah, it sounds interesting yeah I, I agree that i it's it's a a nice and natural thing to do I, but i haven't thought about it yeah okay thanks thanks maybe maybe we can talk later yeah happy please email me yeah i'd be happy to chat yeah. thank you a question by priyadarshi uh, yeah, I, I have a very nice question. Like in ADS, it was very natural to like uh, see this holographic RG flow because there was a boundary and there was a CFT living there. But I did not quite understand like this uh, its interpretation in the static patch. Like why should we uh, like because the, there is dynamic gravity turned on there. No? Like like so what is all, this partition yeah, so, function about? Yeah, can you? Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah. So, so right, right. There, there's but that's good, wonderful. But um. Why did that not work? I could. So this is a bit. I, I view this as somewhat exploratory, right? We, we don't. I don't really know. But but you don't need that. So so somehow what what I got encouraged by is that um, you do have partition functions. I mean this 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 wave function can can be can be you can construct these partition functions and there's a family of them. There's no right exactly very good. So in, in ADCFT, there's a preferred place, which is the boundary, right, where the metric is 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 fixed, and 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 uh, that's a good starting point. But you can have so when you don't have a, a preferred boundary, the natural thing is just to have a Hamilt a family, not one Hamiltonian, but a family of Hamiltonians, but they're all related to each other by the Wheeler DeWitt equation. Okay. But there's not one theory. There's it's it, there's there's a there's a uh, there, there's a family of theories, and so what the the structure the the sort of 
what seemed to make sense in ADS-CFT and looks the same is that when you solve these wheel of the wood equations, there's, there's a, there are two constants of integration that are naturally thought of as the energy and the time. Okay. And, and that, that is just a, and the, um, in ADS, the energy is the ADM energy. And so you're, you're on, on solid ground in the sitter, it's the mass of the black hole. Okay. In, in a static patch. And so the sort of guess or the hope is that this mass, I see all the time, it seems, if you think about it, it's a pretty reasonable hope. It's, it's just saying that the, the mass of the black hole is the energy of some Hamiltonian. Okay. Um, and, and so if, if, and the structure to do that is already there because in, so in the, okay, once, so the, what's really being used is this. So there's a, so the central ingredients are that the Wheeler DeWitt equation comes with, these two constants of integration, M and C. And it's natural to, well, this one is a mass. And so it's natural to think of this one as a time because they're, con they're, 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 they're conjugate to each other. Uh, and so if you want to interpret, so then you keep this as the time and you upgrade this to an expectation value of some Hamiltonian, this Hamiltonian is a function of the background. So yeah, it's a family of Hamilton. Okay, I'm oh, sorry, I'm, I'm being long-winded. There's a there's no boundary, so there's a family of Hamiltonians. Okay. So so it is not going to any classical limit that in ADS study it was going. Here there is. Well, no, the classical limit is 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 when this mass is big, right? I mean, so these these okay. these wave functions, when you build these wave packets, they are supported on 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 classical on classical geometry. So you can build partition function. You can build you can, very good in the sitter space. You could certainly build a wave function. That is strongly supported on on a classical Decida solution. Okay, or, and so, um, yeah, in those wave functions, the semi-classical limit makes sense, right? I mean, it's still. I see. Yeah. Right. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Let me. Sorry, I think there's one more thing to say. So this H was a function of GTT and R. Okay. On a classical solution with a fixed mass and C, GTT and R are not independent, okay? But this, here they are independent because we have not built the wave packet yet, okay? Just like, so this does allow for a quantum fluctuating geometry, right? In the sense that these, these metric components are allowed to vary independently of each other, okay? And so there's no assumption that there's like a, a definite classical metric, right? There's, there's we, we have relaxed, the classical equations of motion in writing down this. When you build a wave, we've relaxed half the classical equations of motion, right? Remember when you, when you do this Hamilton Jacobi, there's this one step where you get S, and there's a second step, right, where you where you where you do that, right? So I've relaxed this step has not been imposed here, and so in that sense, the space time could could be fluctuating, okay? Uh, and it's only when you build the wave packet that you get a definite space time, where GTT and R are related. By the mass. Okay, sorry. Yes, yes. Thank you. Um, are there any more questions? Yeah, if not, yeah. Let's thank Sean for the very nice talk. So thanks, Sean, for spending your time on this. Yeah, yeah. yeah once again, you. sorry, sorry for overrunning uh, so much. Um, <laughs> You could blame uh, Victor Godet, who was here. I saw him at lunch yesterday, and he said that there was no time limit on these talks. So. <laughs> yeah, usually there are no time limits. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so, 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 yeah. Okay. yeah I should go to lunch. Yeah, so, no. yeah very, very good to see all of you. Bye. Thanks for listening. Bye. Thanks for talking.